it is a great pleasure for me to introduce today our speaker for the first plenary conference of this uh, meeting, Martha Anna. Uh, I'll just uh, say a few words maybe in French for our uh, uh, French colleagues who may not be used to North American customs. Uh, il y a cette habitude dans les congrès uh, uh, de, uh, américains uh, de travailler même pendant le repas de midi et donc euh, il y aura aujourd'hui euh, une conférence euh, plénière donc euh, de Martha Anna. Euh, cette, ce congrès est très dense en communication et on continue euh, pendant l'heure du repas. Um, Martha is one of uh, the pillars of the French Historical Studies Association and of the Western Society for French History. She's also one leading North American historians on, on modern France and particularly on the First World War. I'll just uh, say a few words about her, her career and uh, her books uh, in, the last, uh, in the last years. Her first book in, published at Harvard and entitled The Mobilization of Intellect, French Scholars and Writers During the First War, the Great War, examined French intellectual life between 1914 and 1918. It came out in 1996, the same year as Christophe Prochasson and as Anne Rasmussen's book Au nom de la patrie, les intellectuels et la première guerre mondiale. Both books contributed to the renewal of historiography on elite and cultural mobilization uh, during the war. And in this book, Martha focused on the union sacrée of the French academic elite, highlighting the fact that contrary to the common narrative of, of intellectual beings being the embodiment of dissent, French scholars fully embraced the patriotic discourse and participated in the war of words between France and Germany as soon as the publication of the Manifesto of 93 in October 1914. Martha already made use of the soldier letters in her first book, and her, new, her next project would rest on this formidable material. Her article in the American Historical Review in 2003 a Republic of Letters, uh, the Epistolary Tradition in World War I France. And by the way, an article that I use every year, my students read every year in my first World War class, so I thank you for that. Uh, this article explored the cultural practice of letter writing in the French army. Martha arg argued that the French soldiers, as they have learned in Republican school, and despite censorship, didn't depart from what they were used to do. They wrote frank, honest, affectionate letters, sharing as best as they could through their often very limited vocabulary and, and writing capabilities, their war experience to their loved ones. This investigation into letter writing culminated in the publication in 2006 of this uh, great book, multi-prized book, uh, Your Death Will Be Mine, Paul and Marie Piro in the Great War, again published at Harvard University Press. The book won the American Historical Association uh, Russell Major Prize and the Colorado Book Award in 2007, as well as the Distinguished Book Award for the Society for Military History in 2008. A French version was published in 2008 under the title Ta mort sera la mienne. Your Death Will Be Mine is a thorough analysis of a near complete wartime correspondence between Paul and Marie Piro over 1,000 letters. It is a book about letter writing, of course, in the peasant family of Dordogne, but most of all a book about war on the front in France and in Italy, also in the home front, a book about intimacy at distance, love, sexuality, and the founding of a family, about anxiety, modernity, and daily life in the midst of a cataclysmic war. I can't, have but I can't help but citing the first words of Elizabeth Greenall's review of uh, Martha's book. I quote, Among the thousands of books published on World War I, there can be few that juxtapose chapters on the artillery battle around Verdun and on breastfeeding an infant son. Indeed, Martha coup, Martha's coup de force was to offer a perfect balance between two narratives, one that tells the big story of the war itself and the other of this loving couple. Martha's ongoing project is comparative in perspective and will analyze the nature of marriage in France, Great Britain, and Canada during the First World War. Like the Paul and Marie uh, Pierrot's book, it will draw on correspondence of married soldiers and 
to the extent that the source will allow, allow her uh, their wives during the, fir the, wor the First World War. So she will share uh, uh, with us today a part of this uh, project uh, uh, in her conference. So here's to you, Martha. Thank you to Carl, to Norman, to Michel uh, for this wonderful conference. It's lovely to be in Montreal. Um, the Habs are doing great. <laughs> um, years and years ago, uh, when I was growing up in Winnipeg, it was customary to require that every cultural activity had some degree of Canadian content. This is it. <laughs> um, so I hope that what I will have to say to you about the experience of Canadian soldiers on the Western Front will uh, both expand our understanding of the Great War, but also will speak directly to those of you who are first and foremost historians of France. 100 years ago, and almost 50 miles away from this very room, Laurie Rogers was wondering if he would ever make anything of his life. In his early 30s, married with two children, he had struggled to find his true vocation in life. A man of some education and a middle class upbringing, his father had been a major and he had grown up in the English speaking society of late 19th century Montreal, Laurie Rogers had tried his hand at many pursuits, but feared that he had failed at all of them. He and his wife, May, had been married for 13 years and had only recently decided to take up farming in Quebec's eastern townships in the town of East Farnham. That, too, was a struggle. And so he looked upon the outbreak of war as a new opportunity in which he could serve his country and at the same time prove to his intimidating and highly critical father-in-law that he was not an abject failure after all. Like many of the 650,000 men who served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, his battalion was confined to a sector of the Western Front that ran from the villages of the Somme, northwestward through Arras and Vimy, and onwards to Ypres. His experiences of combat were as harrowing as those recounted by many of the most prominent memoirists of the war, and his mood and morale as mercurial. He remained, however, resolutely committed to the cause of victory. But unlike the men who served in the French army, for whom, not surprisingly, the defense of France and the liberation of French soil were causes worth dying for, Laurie Rogers had no pre-existing affection for or identification with France. Indeed, he was sometimes at a loss to know if he was even in France, let alone def defending it. As he mused at one melancholy moment in late May of 1916, when weeks of fighting had numbed his senses and blurred his ability to make fine geographical distinctions, the Western Front was one indistinguishable morass. He was, he confessed, somewhere in France or Belgium, it don't matter which. <laughs> If Laurie Rogers was hard pressed to distinguish France from Belgium, if the defense of La Patrie, which was so central to the fighting resolve of French troops on the Western Front, was a matter of supreme indifference to him, and as we will see, many of the men who served in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, if in short, they were fighting in France, but not for France, how did their perceptions and experiences of this unfamiliar land influence how they thought about the war? I would like to propose that Canadian soldiers perceived France in three distinct ways. As was true of all frontline combatants, they saw the Western Front as an alien, unreal, horrific landscape. <laughs> 
but unlike the French who nonetheless knew that the front was deeply etched into French soil, Canadian troops experienced the Western Front as an essentially a national space, marked by nothing but mud, misery, noxious smells, and relentless noise. Like all combatant troops, however, Canadian soldiers did not and could not exist exclusively in the inhospitable hell of the front lines. Thus, their perceptions of France were also shaped by their contact with and experiences in the civilian hinterlands in the devastated towns and villages immediately behind the lines, and more beguilingly, but also much more infrequently, in Paris. Each of these spaces was radically different from home. Paris was more glorious, the Western Front more horrific, and the hinterlands of the Front more tragic. And in their radical dissimilarity from home, each of these spaces of war reinforced Canadian soldiers' persistent homesickness. But it was the civilian misery evident in the regions immediately behind the front lines which reinforced their conviction in the justice of their cause. The Germans, they believed at the outset and continued to believe through the very end of the war, really were barbarians and a German victory really would endanger not just Europe, but the entire civilized world, including Canada. To trace Laurie Rogers' military career is to follow a Via Dolorosa of Canadian combat. He enlisted in early 1915, trained in Britain through the summer and fall, and embarked for France in December of 1915. His regiment, the Canadian Mounted Rifles, served in France until March of 16 and was then transferred to Ypres. Serving as a stretcher bearer, he was back in France by early May, but returned to Belgium shortly thereafter. Having survived an intense battle near Ypres in June of 16, he subsequently saw action on the Somme, at Vimy, and at Passchendaele. From his peripatetic perspective, there was little to distinguish the front lines of France from those of Belgium. Thus, in February of 1916, while still in France, he wrote, we had one hot day when the Germans handed us about every kind of shell they had. The noise was a regular inferno, and without cussing, it was just as near hell as I want to get. Every shell that broke near us sent mud in showers all over us, with sometimes pieces of shell, not very big pieces though. This was, after all, a letter to his wife. Belgium was no better. I'm out of the trenches again and not a bit sorry for it, I can assure you. It's not so much the German shells or bullets that get my nerve, it is the awful sights I have to see and the wounds I have to dress that is so hard. And then back in France, you will be glad to hear that I am again out of the trenches with a whole skin. We had a terrible time up in the front line, and I've been pretty well through a regular hell. Frank Mahou, a French Canadian soldier from uh, the Ottawa Valley, had a frontline pilgrimage that resembled in many respects that of Laurie Rogers. But Mahou's command of written English, his second language, was less assured, and he too failed to see any appreciable difference between Belgium and France. Indeed, although many soldiers identified their location on the line with the generic somewhere in France or somewhere in Belgium, Mahou did so only intermittently. Just as often, perhaps even more so, he specified only that he was in the trenches or at rest. Perhaps he realized that for his wife and children, far removed from the Western Front, and unfamiliar with the names of towns and villages that signified so much to French families, his precise location on the line mattered very little. His proximity to immediate danger mattered enormously. Thus, in October of 1915, when his battalion was in Belgium, he made no explicit mention of the fact. Rather, he confided only, 
I'm in the trenches again. Poor wife, it's very bad here. Right in the trenches in front of me, covered with dead soldiers. Came here at night, next morning start to put sandbags. Start to work with a pick and shovel. We came on a dead man leg and we left the place. Went four or four, five feet further up, came to another one. It's people buried, very quick, only a few shovel full of clay over them. It's a hundred times worse than a graveyard because they're hardly buried. Some French, English, poor Canadians. They are shelling us heavy now, but it is for us like nothing. Like many a frontline soldier, Mahu was appalled by the mud of Flanders. We came out from the trenches, we had mud to our knees, raining all the time. The place where we're going to rest, everything wet, freezes all night. I never saw a country like this one. But a year later, when his regiment was recovering from its stint on the Somme, he was equally unimpressed by France. It's worse or as bad as Belgium. It rains and rains. Water over our boots. Our clothes are all wet. No place for rest. It's a hell of a place. I'm wet true and the worse I have to be on, I have to be on the go all the time. When I think we'll have to pass another winter, them countries, France and Belgium, I wouldn't give a cent for it. Then as now, however, Paris had an allure all its own. Because Canadian troops could not return home on leave, they flocked either to London, where some had family members, and others were eager to make acquaintances with young women who spoke English, or they went to Paris, where the young women didn't speak English. Some disappointments were inevitable. When Thomas Louis Tremblay, the young unmarried commanding officer of the French Canadian battalion, the 22, went to Paris on leave in January of 1916, he had great hopes for meeting his marin de guerre. Having imagined a lovely, lissom young lady, amenable to his amorous attentions, he was more than a little disappointed to discover instead a portly grand dame well into her 60s and confined to a wheelchair. His romantic reveries quickly dashed he retained, nonetheless, a deep appreciation of Paris's architectural beauty, and he returned there eagerly whenever he had leave. Nor was he the only one. Paris was a place of wonder for all and of sensual delights for many. Don Brown spent New Year's in Paris in 1918 and confessed to his sister that he had never seen such a beautiful city as Paris before. The hotel I'm staying at is near the oldest church in Paris. His facts seem to be a little odd here, but we'll go, we'll go with them. The church is in the Place de Madeleine. I wish you could see it. <laughs> it's sure fine. The king and queen of France used to worship here. <laughs> it does not look like a church on the outside. It looks more like a town hall. There's no steeple to it, but it's very beautiful inside. Then there's Napoleon's monument and other places too numerous to mention. There's no shortage of food in this town. A person can eat what they like but it's rather expensive. One thing, these Frenchmen know how to eat and prepare food. <laughs> On New Year's Eve, the proprietors of this hotel gave us a kind of social evening. They had some champagne and they gave me some. Tastes just like apple cider. <laughs> <laughs> the only transgression Brown would admit was that he partook quite free, freely of the champagne and so was slightly inebriated. He suspected, however, that there were other pleasures awaiting those who went looking for them. There are hundreds of people on the streets at all times of both sexes who are up to no good. <laughs> this was also George Davidson's judgment following his leave in September of 1917. But his appreciation of Paris and all it could offer a man on leave was tempered by loneliness and frustrated desire. As he observed to his wife, 
Paris is certainly worth seeing and is beyond all question a most beautiful city. However, three days there were ample for me and I was really glad to get out of it. I got now so I positively hate cities. I feel most terribly lonesome while I'm in them. All the time I was in Paris, I was traveling around alone. And I want to tell you that I missed you very, very much. He resented the shopkeepers who jacked up their prices because they knew that Canadian soldiers had money to burn. More than that, however, the sexual temptations that Paris put in the path of men on leave were a special torment for a married man intent on honoring his marriage vows. Davidson confessed that he was glad to be back with his unit because, quote, the temptations once while, whilst one is traveling around are fierce. However, I think I deserve a special medal for virtue. <laughs> Having traveled through southern France to the Italian border, which is one of the most immoral countries of the world, <laughs> through gay Paris, whose reputation is well known, without once falling from the path of grace or doing anything I would not have done had you been with me. Perhaps George Davidson had the strength of character to avoid sensual temptation, but many Canadian soldiers who had a reputation for free spending and raucous ways did not. In July of 1917, all Canadian leave to Paris was temporarily suspended because the men had enjoyed the city's pleasures not wisely, but too well. Agar Adamson, the commanding officer of the Princess Patricia Light Infantry, commonly called the Princess Pats, remarked to his wife, all leave to Paris has been called off. I understand on account of some men of the Canadian regiments behaving disgracefully and also contracting disease. He was relieved, however, that the Princess Pats had not been among the worst offenders. Out of 100 men we sent, only one case has been reported. However much they appreciated the charms, architectural and otherwise, of Paris, Canadian soldiers were much less impressed by what they saw of daily life in the towns and villages immediately behind the lines. In the judgment of many, France was a backward society whose population was hardened by poverty, inspired by avarice, and utterly untouched by the amenities of modern life. Don Brown, who was of the opinion that, quote, nearly everything they do over here is about 100 years behind our way of doing things, quote, was struck by the fact that they even bind their grain by hand and they thresh with horsepower. He could not help but take note of how the French baked their bread. They build a hot fire in a large furnace-like thing. They get it good and hot. Then they rake out all the fire and they throw the formed loaves in on the bare hot floor. In the mining district immediately south of Vimy, where Canadian troops were massing in April of 1917, family life seemed to conjure images straight out of Germinal. The very youngest little girl smoked cigarettes without their mothers minding a bit. I have yet to see a clean, fresh peach of a child. Of course, you must have in mind this is wartime. The people are dog poor. The men are away. The Germans are only three miles away. It's a mining district, and their houses are all occupied by foreigners. Poverty made French civilians a money-grubbing lot, or so some Canadians thought. In August of 1917, a soldier remarked that young French kids bring papers right up to the front lines when they can get a hold of them. A French civil will face the whole German army for a franc. Stuart Tompkins, an educated man from Edmonton who went on to a distinguished academic career after the war, conceded that, quote, France is a wonderfully beautiful country when the sun is shining and it is halfway decent. I don't wonder that Frenchmen love it, but the material misery of civilians rent his heart 
One never sees a really clean, attractive woman or a cozy home. Thank you, first boat to Canada will do me nicely. Straight through to Edmonton, Alberta. Even, that's for Norman. <laughs> Even if the women and children of northern France were scruffy, unwashed, and altogether miserable in appearance, Canadian soldiers were not blind to their suffering or unmoved by the distress the war had wrought. The physical destruction of their homes, the prevalence of mourning, and the abject plight of refugees all made a deep impression. Frank Mahou wrote more than once of the sorrow that pervaded civilian French society. The poor French people, they are very good. Every family lost somebody. Everybody's in black. The people are very modest. They're better than the Belgians. I like them better. They will be thousand and thousand poor widows after the war. It's a fright the way it is. Every man in the French nation they are fighting. You see girls and women working in coal mine. It's a pity to see them. After all, the poor people, they're kind and happy because they know we are going toward victory. But at what cost? A few weeks later, in mid-December of 1916, he returned to these flat, sad reflections. Poor Angeline, it makes me sorry to see the people behind the front lines. Most of the people are in mourning, dressed in black. And after all, the peop poor people, they don't say a word about the war. It is for the country. It is nice, but sad for a stranger. This was also Don Brown's observation as he returned from a leave that had taken him as far south as Nice. On the one hand, he subscribed to a common cultural perception that the French were, quote, so light, frivolous, and effeminate that he could not understand how the heavy Germans did not drive clear through them, unquote. At the same time, however, he was struck by their stoic endurance in the face of ubiquitous loss. Of course, they have suffered most terribly in losses. Almost every family has lost someone. Many of the fields and vineyards are full of weeds and show the lack of labor. More than anything else, however, contact with the refugees who had, won who had been displaced by German advances and civilians who lived in the direct shadow of war prompted in these Canadian men a profound compassion for the suffering of French civilians and a great sense of relief that their own families had been spared the direct devastation of war. For married men in particular, the sorry, sorry plight of young children uprooted from their homes or subjected to the intermittent assault of enemy artillery tore at their hearts and reinforced their conviction that the war was one in which only one side deserved to win. This was true whether the men came in contact with refugees displaced from their homes in the first year of the war, or with civilians whose, whose homes fell within the range of enemy guns in 1917 and 1918, or with those who had lived under German occupation for the duration of the war until their towns and cities were finally liberated in October of 1918. Canadian soldiers had heard since the very earliest weeks of the war stories, real, exaggerated, and completely invented of atrocities that had befallen Belgian civilians in August of 1914. For some, these tales had spurred them to enlist. For others, it reinforced their conviction that enlistment had indeed been the right thing to do. Jack Davies' blood boiled, for example, when he heard stories while training in England of German attacks on Belgian and British civilians. And his thoughts about the German assault um, could be summarized thus. They don't deserve any mercy at all after that. And instead of keeping them as prisoners at the country's expense, they ought to be shot at once, and that would be a better death than lots of them deserve. A close encounter with civilian refugees who continued to throng the village roads behind the lines had a similar effect on George Ormsby, who was in France by the spring of 1915. 
He described for his wife and two children in rural Alberta the following scene. About the saddest sight I've ever witnessed was yesterday when some refugees went through. One particular group caught my eye. A man pushing a perambulator in which were two babies squalling. The mother walking alongside with two other children. The children were dog tired and one was lame. I got one of our boys who speaks their language to ask them, what was the matter? And the reply was that the Germans had shelled their home and destroyed it. Everything went up in smoke and they barely escaped with their lives. The woman did not even have a shawl or a hat on, just an apron. She carried no bundle, so was destitute. I can tell you it made my blood boil. Later I found out that the village to which they belonged was completely destroyed. Well, goodbye, sweetheart, and God bless you and the children. Be of good cheer, and thank God that your husband is fighting for the fatherless and the oppressed. Every time I think of that poor refugee family, it nerves my heart for the fight that is ahead. George Timmons, a family man with a wife and four children in Oshawa, Ontario, was similarly moved by the plight of children close to the firing lines. In September of 1917, when his enthusiasm for war had been well tested and much eroded, he found a reason to continue the fight in an encounter with a young mother and her two children. How's things with all our little old family, he wondered. I often think of them and feel I'd give anything to see them. The other Sunday, a chum and I were sitting on a bank on the side of the road resting when a French lady came by with two little girls. Say, one was like Molly must be, fair with blue eyes and long fair hair, healthy fat cheeks. I spoke to her in my best French and I asked her for a kiss. Say, her mother told her to kiss the bon soldat and she came right over and kissed me. Hun, I made a kid of myself right there. I just had to hug that kid for as long as she'd stand for it. Her mother informed me that they were refugees from La Bazée and that the Germans had come right through the place where they were living and that they had had to beat it without a thing and had to go hungry and nowhere to sleep. I felt I could kill a German any old time for the sake of that kid and the way she must have suffered. Several months later, in the spring of 1918, when the German army had advanced deep into the Allied lines and had forced the evacuation of villages that previously had been protected from German gunfire, George Timmons' awareness of civilian suffering reinforced his much battered morale. I think we are very lucky that the war is being fought in Europe on that account that our babies can play around and grow fat without getting mixed up with shells and things. I saw an incident about two months ago which is fixed in my mind by the very tragedy of it. We were in a small pr town pretty close to the line, in fact close enough for Heine to shell it every day. Not much you know, but every day somebody would get hit. Sometimes, as on one occasion, he dropped one right on the road outside our camp and killed about nine or ten, wounded a big bunch. One night we were sitting by a canteen talking and watching three little kitties playing, just like my little girls used to, when suddenly we heard a big one coming. You can hear them coming. It's a noise like a streetcar coming through the air. Say those poor little kids, they just stopped their play and looked up as though they could see it. The two bigger ones, about four years old I should say, followed it over in the direction it was traveling with their eyes. But the poor little one that I picked out for my special notice, looking as she did so much like my little girl when I left home, she'd be about two and a half maybe. Say I felt my heart ache for that little one. The look of fear that came into her eyes. She was laughing and trying to chatter to the others when the noise first struck us. She turned around to run into the house. When she found it was over us and passed, she about turns again and was playing again, almost as happily as ever. I say almost, because the look of trouble was still in that poor little one's eyes. God grant that none of mine ever hear a shell coming.
War is hell, all right. In the final months of the war, Canadian troops participated in the 100-day advance that liberated territory held by Germany since the earliest weeks of the war. Moving northwards from Amiens, they first reclaimed territory that had been nothing but a battle zone for four years. But by October, they were taking from the Hun places that had never been battlefields. And what they found in these long-suffering towns was enough to assure them that theirs had been the cause of justice. When Bertram Cox's artillery battery entered Cambrai in October of 1918, he observed that the remainder of the population, he has taken away many to work in Germany, are still here, living a life of bondage for four years. You can quite understand their enthusiasm and joy as we drove the enemy out and take possession. They can't do too much for us. They won't take any money, but about all they have to offer is coffee and cocoa. And any beer and wine that has escaped the eyes of the Hun, it's ours for the asking. Canadian soldiers, lucky enough to spend their leave in the city of life, Light quickly learned to love Paris. Few of them liked France. And truth be told, who could blame them? For these men, thousands of miles from family and home, France was not so much a cause to be defended as a site of desolation, suffering, and death. Yet for all the misery these men endured, and all the horrors they had confronted while serving somewhere in France or Belgium, it don't matter which, they remained committed to the cause for which they had enlisted. And I would suggest that that commitment derived as much from what they had witnessed behind the lines as from what they had to bear at the front itself. The suffering of civilians simultaneously deepened their own profound homesickness and convinced the men of the Canadian Expeditionary Force that theirs remained the cause of justice. <coughs> Let us return then to Laurie Rogers, who by August of 1916 had seen his full share of wartime horrors. Having survived an especially bloody battle in early June of 16, during which he won the Military Medal for Heroism Under Fire, he reflected on his nine months of service on the Western Front and concluded that, quote, he had never been sorry that he had come over here. His fondest wish to be reunited with his family and reclaim the tranquil life of a gentleman farmer was not, however, to be. Lori Rogers was killed on the 30th of October, 1917, at Passchendaele. Nestled in his uniform pocket was the tiny teddy bear that his daughter, Eileen, had knitted for him as a good luck token when he went for war. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. We, we have, uh, uh, yes, uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions, uh, uh, comments, if you would like to, uh, uh, for intervention, yes. Um, so the, the evidence that you have from these very Canadian soldiers about the impact of civilians and sick children, would, would, would anything be comparable for single men? Is it? That's a really good question. Some of the there's much more direct evidence that if it affected the married soldiers, who constituted somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the Canadian soldiers who served in France. Um, and I think for the reasons that show up, that, you know, there is this deep sense of empathy and identification with their families at home. Um, because my project is really focusing on married soldiers, okay. I haven't really expanded. Some of the people I quote in here are not married. Uh, okay. But the ones who were most deeply affected by the, the sights of civilian, and particularly children suffering, tended to be married. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks so much. That was a really great talk. Uh, can you hear me okay? That was a really great talk. I was wondering if you could say something, given that in Canada at the time there was um, such difficult relations between Anglo and Franco Canadians, I was wondering if the war experience might have changed uh, some of the attitudes perhaps of uh, these English Canadians about their French Canadians when they returned from the war. Uh, unfortunately, it, it did change Eng many English Canadian soldiers sentiments towards French Canadians but not in a good way. Um, the, the, the crisis over conscription in 1917 in Canada tended to intensify an already fraught relationship between English Canada and French Canada and there was a sense among English Canadian soldiers that French Canadian soldiers had not enlisted to the same degree. Now there were very good reasons why that was the case and one reason that I haven't seen explored I think as deeply as perhaps it would merit is there, there's only one French speaking French commanded battalion in the CEF and that's the Vendue. Uh, there their officers are francophone and all of the the functioning of the battalion is done in French. All other French, all other battalions in the CEF are English and that means that if you are a French Canadian soldier, like Frank Meu, uh, serving in a battalion that's other than the 22nd, your immediate commanding officers were all Ang Anglophone. And because of the way censorship was Im uh, imposed in the CEF and in and the British Expeditionary Force, that meant that your commanding officer was the person who read your letters. So I'm assuming, I haven't found direct evidence that all of their letters had to be written in English. And that of course would be a serious impediment to a Francophone soldier wanting to enlist in anything except the 22nd Battalion. Uh, and but moreover the very fact that the military commanders of the CEF were so resistant to expanding the opportunities for French Canadian soldiers generated this sense that they don't really want us. Um, and, that this re and that generated this notion, well, this is somebody else's war. Whereas half of the, half of the men who served in the CEF had been born in Britain. So they had a very strong immediate familial connection to the old country. So it makes a huge difference. But as a consequence, there was very, very deep animosity coming back from the front um, ab about conscripts in general, people who had been required to fight as opposed to people who had volunteered to fight, and then about those who had chosen to do whatever they could to avoid fighting at all. When I'm not, is this working? It's being recorded. Oh, okay. When I'm not reading books on French history, I'm often reading People magazine. <laughs> and in their Heroes Among Us section, it's often stories of U.S. soldiers who are abroad, who are touched by the plight of the locals and begin a philanthropy or a charity. I was wondering if you see any evidence of that in these sources, that, that combination of fighting war but then establishing ties or identifying with with the place through asking people back home to send supplies um, I haven't come across any references to that um, another part of this very big project that will probably take the rest of my life um, is about sort of the transnational character of marriage and there's a lot of evidence about Canadian soldiers marrying when they go to Britain there's some evidence about them marrying when they go in, in France or in Belgium um, and but the evidence that I've encountered about so that's indirect I mean it's not you know it's um, not really addressing your question directly but um, interestingly the evidence I have come across about those kinds of very direct connections between Canadian troops and uh, the French or, Bel or Belgian civilians uh, comes out of records about bigamy in <laughs> um, particular what there was one quite um, controversial international cause célèbre when a Canadian soldier who was already married married a young Belgian woman and then refused to take her home and the Belgian embassy got involved and the French uh, the Canadian Foreign Affairs Office it was it was a major kerfuffle uh, but I haven't seen that same kind of sort of broad-based 
philanthropy. But, but I suspect it may well be that although Canadians felt they were more affluent than, than the Europeans, most of them were recent immigrants who were just struggling to sort of make make ends meet for their own families. So they perhaps lacked those kinds of philanthropic connections that would allow them to do something more substantial than that. It's, it's a guess. <laughs> Hi, Mark. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the non-combatants, if there were any from Canada, that uh, went to France during during the war. As you know, in the United States, there are a lot of NGOs that are sent over there. Uh, the American Field Service, the most famous, but uh, Anne Morgan and other uh, humanitarian mm -hmm. uh, organizers sent a lot of uh, non-combatant yep. people to work for uh, the people that were suffering in France. Yeah. Was there anything like that in Canada? Not that I know of. But is anybody an expert on Canadian domestic politics? And I, I, haven't see, I haven't come across any references to that at all. Mm -hmm. But perhaps it's because the sources I've been looking at are sort of from another direction. Is it just another one then, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you saw enough um, materials to see if there was any difference between in the reactions from the French-speaking Canadian soldiers versus the English-speaking Canadian soldiers, following mm -hmm. a little bit on tips. Um, question. To be honest, the, the extant col um, archival collection of French-Canadian records is very limited. I, I haven't gone to Quebec City, which is where the, the archives of the, of, the, of the 22nd Battalion are, and there may well be materials there. But the work that I've done in Ottawa and that through the Canadian uh, War Museum said that there are very, very few extant connections. And I suspect it's connected to this notion that if you're serving in a non-Francophone unit, there would be very little opportunity to, to generate the kinds of sources that, that have survived and have been donated to the archives. But as I say, I, I really need to get up to Quebec City and see what's in the event too. You know, it's interesting because of course, to the extent that the Francophone community in Quebec identified with France, they didn't identify with the Third Republic. No. They identified with a very conservative Catholic, almost pre-1789 France, right? And to, they would say that they were going, if they, if they were volunteering to fight, they were going to volunteer to fight to defend Catholic France. Um, so there isn't that sense of immediate, and in fact, if anything, there's a sense of, you know, we don't want to fight for the British. If that's not our cause. And we're not necessarily sure that we want to fight for the Third Republic either, uh, which I think is one of the reasons that there is um, less enthusiasm. There's quite a bit of enthusiasm earlier in the war, and then it, uh, it abates uh, more quickly in, in French Canada. I think because there's a sense like this isn't really our war. Yeah. yeah Michel, then there's a question here. <coughs> As a French Canadian, but a medievalist, I don't know very much about the, uh, the this period of history. But I can add uh, one part of local history is that in French Canada, uh, these years were the years of the foreclosure of uh, French schools in Ontario, yes. and when the French language education was forbidden. So the uh, refusal to go fight for the English was also uh, tied with this uh, local problem. We had this slogan that ran in French Canada that uh, "Notre Bosch," the Bosch being the uh, uh, Slang, French slang for the German, notre Bosch, c'est l'anglais. Uh, our, <laughs> our German enemy is the Englishman. Yeah. And the figure of Joan of Arc, uh, which was so important in France for the fight against the Germans, was raised in French Canada for the fight for the French schools against the English in Ontario. So this is local history, but it helps to explain yep. the, the more Absolutely. general point of and this uh, uh, draft dodging for, okay. from French And, and certainly the, the, this reference to what's happening in, in the Ontario schools comes up repeatedly yes. as, as an explanation for why, why should we fight for these guys? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I just wondered with your project, do you follow what happened after the war at all? I mean, like to Lloyd Rogers' family or some of the other soldiers that you read the letters for, or is that just beyond the scope? Um, I wish I could. Uh, right now, it's, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what the important points of similarity and differences are between the French, the British, and the Canadian experiences of the war. And I'm identifying some, some interesting, I think perhaps unexpected, points of similarity um, during the war. But then, of course, when Laurie dies, the record ends. And you know, there are pension records and things like that. But, um, but one of the things that does emerge that I think, I hope will be sort of the focus of a, at least a chapter, is war wives respond to the challenges of separation very similarly in these three communities. And they do so by creating sort of melded households. Yeah. In most cases, they will go back and live with their parents, which is a problem. <laughs> uh, in some instances, two war wives will work together. And you know, because there are childcare issues, there are financial issues, there's the loneliness problem, there, you know, there are all kinds of reasons why you might want to, to do that. Uh, but what, what happens after the war, I don't know. And to, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll close on this. The reason I'm interested in this particular topic and thinking about the way in which these two communities, the home front and the military front, coexisted during the war, um, my great-grandmother was, she wasn't one of the people I've cited here, because as far as I know, there are no letters. But her husband enlisted from Oshawa, just outside Toronto, um, in 1915, and left her with six kids and a seventh on the way. And he, they were recent immigrants from England. There was a very strong sense that they needed to go back and defend the, the homeland. And he was killed in October of 16 and left my great-grandmother with seven kids to raise. And the family story is that my grandfather, who was 13, had to quit school to go to work so that he could help her, his mom support the family. So I suspect there are a lot of similar stories like that where, you know, a lot of a lot of financial stress, a lot of emotional stress, um, and hey, any of you who have been a single parent for more than five hours <laughs> <laughs> will know that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, phys it, it's really hard work. Yeah. Thank yeah, thanks. John. John. Uh, th th thanks very much, Martha, for a, such, such a moving um, uh, presentation. You, I mean, you drew a wonderful picture of the mythic um, framework of, of, of these Canadian soldiers. By mythic, I, d I don't mean false. I just mean the kind of distilled stories that yeah. they told about themselves and yeah. the enemy. But, but the elements that you identified, the, the, the German atrocities, uh, the suffering of the French civilians and so on, they're things which one could equally find amongst um, British soldiers or indeed yeah. French soldiers. Was there anything specifically Canadian in that mythic framework of reference? I and mean, I'm thinking of the fact that that the Canadians um, uh, are amongst the first victims on the 26th, 22nd of April 1915 yes. of poisonous gas. Yep. There's the myth of the crucified um, mm -hmm. French Canadian. Yep. There's the, the triumph at Vimy. Yep. Uh, are these part of a kind of contemporary self-definition by Canadian soldiers, or are these largely retrospective myths in the interwar period, which are used to construct in the way Jonathan Vance has, 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 has yep. uh, described for us, mm -hmm. a, a kind of retrospective identity? The, these are all, all these so sources were letters written from the front. or from, uh, So these, these were the ways in which Canadian soldiers were making the war make sense to themselves and then to, the, to their families. And I think your, your point is absolutely on the mark. That there's a lot that we will see in the, in the British or in the French experience that's very similar. Where I think the key difference emerges is in this fact that Canadian soldiers don't get to go home on leave. And so there's that very profound homesickness that you see, especially in 17 and 18. And, and men who had really been through hell, and this sort of begins to, tip, to sort of tie into the debate about conscription, begin to feel that they have done their bit. They, want, they, they just want to go home. And there's a promise made by politicians, of course, um, that men who had served from 15 onwards would be eligible for a three-month furlough. Um, 
And that was a promise made just before a national election. And just after the national election, they discovered that it was really going to be difficult for them to make that promise stick. Uh, and, and that causes a great deal of anger um, in the ranks of the, of the CEF. But I, th I think it, more than anything else, what we see is this enormous homesickness which is more pr pronounced for married soldiers, but it's, it's pretty obvious for, for single men too, uh, especially when they see you know, British soldiers going, going back to, to the UK and French soldiers going home and so forth. Um, they, they, and every single source, you know, people who are reading, you know, censoring the Canadian letters, people who are writing the Canadian letters, they, it's, it's there all the time. These guys are just profoundly homesick. Maybe a last question, maybe? I, I really appreciate the, the uh, account you've given us of these individuals and the way you're approaching this. I wonder if you could um, suggest how you think this kind of approach to the war, let's say the, the personal letters experiences, mm -hmm. how does this connect with or alter a more general, let's say, narrative of the significance of the First World War? Um, you know, politically, economic, the sort of things we might see in a textbook, you know, <laughs> about why the war matters. How do you connect the two layers mm -hmm. of history? Well, I think the, mo the most important point to emerge from these kinds of sources is that the home front and the military front remain deeply um, implicated. They, they, they care about each other. And although they don't necessarily understand the sort of the gut experience of what it is to be a soldier. There, there is this constant sense of, of connection. And I think as a consequence, we as historians have perhaps overstated the intensity of alienation that sets in after the war. That for some, that is absolutely the case. But for many, many, for the people who do make it home, um, they want to continue to build on those connections that, that, that had sustained them during the war. And, and so I, I really do not buy into this notion of an embittered and alienated front generation returning home incapable of reintegrating into civilian society. So that's, I think that's the big message. Uh, I'm sure that you, you have uh, other we questions, have, yeah. but the afternoon session starts in 15 minutes, so I just want to thank again my first speaker.